Hello there, and today we're going to look at the poem Poppies by Jane Weir. And to start with, we'll think about the two questions here. Um, why have poppies come to represent those who have lost their lives in war? And what big ideas do you predict will be explored in Weir's poem? But to begin with, let's think about the symbol of the poppy and why it has come to be associated with war. So the, long, the poppy has a long association with Remembrance Day, uh, or you may know it as Armistice Day, and that is a word that appears in the poem. And Armistice Day is on the 11th of November, which is why you see the little red paper poppies appearing around that time in autumn. And uh, just want to think about the significance of that date, the 11th of November, um, and that date is when the First World War came to an end, 11th of November in 1918. And the poppy has come to be a symbol of remembrance for the sacrifices that so many men and women made in past wars, not just the First World War, but since then it's also come to be a remembrance for all those who have lost their lives in conflict. And I suppose the question is why? Why a poppy has come to symbolise these lives lost? And first of all, I think of, I suppose, the most immediate thing is the colour, the colour red, and how it seems suitable in a way as it suggests the spilt blood of wounded soldiers. However, there is another reason, and it's a reason to do with nature. And it's actually because these red poppies were the only thing to grow in the disturbed earth of Western Europe, where the battles of First World War had been fought. Swathes of these red poppies grew around the bodies of the fallen soldiers on otherwise barren battlefields. So their significance is associated with actually physically the end of the war uh, itself. Now maybe pause for a moment to consider what big ideas you predict will be explored in Weir's poem. Okay, so you may have had a moment to think about that and we're going to now start to consider these questions about the poem uh, before looking at the poem itself. What is Weir's message about grief and the female experience of war? How does Weir present her thoughts on this? And why is Weir concerned with the effects of war on those left behind? Before we begin with the poem, we're just going to take a quick look and you can pause again the video and have a look, have a read through a little bit about Jane Weir herself. And I think there's two quite interesting points in here. Uh, so the first is that she was the mother of two teenage boys, and you can see there. Uh, so she was speaking from a mother's perspective, and I think that's really important in this poem, the fact that she was a mother and that she was speaking for so many mothers who perhaps, whose voice perhaps wasn't heard during that time. One thing that isn't mentioned in, in this, on this slide is that she was a textile designer uh, and so involved in clothing and fabric. And you may notice some of that influence in the poem. But what I'd like you to do for a moment is to read through, pause the slide uh, and read through about Jane Weir and see if you can reduce the information into four bullet points about her. Okay, so we're going to come to the poem now, and it is on two slides, but what I would like you to do is spend a couple of minutes reading through, and then we will have a look together. So pause the, pause the slide now. Okay, so I wonder how you found that. Um, lots of people find this poem quite difficult because it's not very clear what has happened to the sun. And whether here, before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, we wonder, perhaps, is he on his way to school? Or here, a split second and you were away, intoxicated, whether he's on his way to war. 
So there's uncertainty about the boy, his age and what he's doing. And equally, I find myself unsure if her son is alive or dead. So is this a memory to her when she smooths down his collar or when she resists the impulse to run her fingers through the gelled blackthorns of his hair? And is this the, in the final stanza? Where is it? Is this the very last, the very last sentence? I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Is this her longing to hear her son again uh, when he has died, perhaps in war? So I think there is ambiguity and the poet has meant for us to be uncertain and questioning as a reader. And perhaps she's done this because it is like the experience of so many mothers who were left behind in war. For those mothers and for those people who were left behind and weren't in the conflict, there must have been a constant sense of unanswered questions as people knew so little about their loved ones away in battle. And of course, this was in the days before mobile phones and before emails and texts and social media. So you were lucky if you ever got a letter sent from the, the front lines. So, yeah, I think there was real uncertainty and sadness and fear and perhaps anxiety in those left behind, which I think the ambiguity is trying to capture. So perhaps I got ahead of myself a little bit there, um, but let's make sure that we can grasp what happens in the poem. So in the first stanza, we learn that it is almost Armistice Day and she, the mother, is with her son pinning a poppy onto his blazer. Is it his school blazer or his military blazer? In the second stanza, the poet focuses on the motherly affection between the speaker and her son, but the mother is holding back, being brave, perhaps not wanting her son to see her emotions. In the third stanza, the son leaves, and we sense that he is full of the wonders of the world and excitement at what is to come while she has been containing all her fears. And finally, in the fourth stanza, the poet returns to the theme of remembrance when the mother visits the war memorial, possibly to remember her son whose life we believe may have been claimed by war. So we're going to think a bit about grief and the female experience of war now. And we're going to think about the poet and how she juxtaposes the language of textiles with that of war. And she does this throughout the poem. Juxtapose means to use them alongside one another uh, to, to create a very strong contrast. And we're going to think about why she does this. So here in stanza one, she speaks of the poppy as spasms of red, red paper right here. And then here about disrupting a blockade of yellow bias, a yellow bias binding. And yellow bias binding is a fabric that goes around the edge of a blazer. And here, as she performs a motherly act of pinning a poppy to her son's lapel, the poet disrupts this with these two words, spasms and blockades. So spasms suggests someone who has been very badly injured and is moving involuntarily, um, sort of like having a fit, uh, jerky movements that you might have if you are badly injured. And a blockade is a military term um, where you would block a road with a roadblock, something like that. Um, and these, I think here the poet wants to show us by disrupting this motherly action of pinning a poppy onto his lapel with these military words. I think the poet wants to show us how grief and the consequences of war are never far from a mother's thoughts. Again, sorry, go back there. Again, in the second stanza, the kind and affectionate actions of the mother as she is rounding up the cat hairs is contrasted with how this is done. So not just with sellotape, but with sellotape bandaged around her hand. And again, this image of the wounded and dying 
allows grief and sadness to seep into this otherwise affectionate motherly image. And also with the word bandage, I'm sure you would have picked up on this, we're also reminded of nurses. And of course, nurses are another, more likely than not, female perspective of war. But why all of these references to fabric? So I was wondering about this, and I considered that in the past, sewing and clo clothes making have typically been women's jobs. Perhaps less so today, but very commonly in the past they were. And so this seems to be quite a natural language to use in the poem. And I think of the phrase, make, do and mend, which originated actually in World War II and came from a pamphlet for housewives. The idea was that women were expected to repair, to renew and to create from the things that they had at home. And I think this links to the role of women in war that Weir is trying to portray. Women had to use their initiative, they had to make do with what they had and to cope with whatever came their way. I think this is also this idea of coping and being strong when perhaps you are not feeling it. Uh, this is reflected with the need for a mother to be outwardly strong for those around her to cope again. And we see this in stanza two, when she steeled the softening of her face. Steel is a hard metal like that found in war and she steals her softening face. She does this to protect her son from her emotions, not wanting him to be aware of how she is feeling. Again, we see this need for the mother to be strong when in stanza three here, she says, I was brave. She does not want for her experience to get in the way of her son's. Her experience must be secondary to his, she feels, as she allows him to view the world as he wants to see it, as overflowing like a treasure chest. This simile suggests how she imagines her son views the future, full of rich experiences awaiting him. Meanwhile, here, she uses the metaphor intoxicated to suggest he is under the spell of war and this new adventure before the terrible reality must inevitably kick in. When she speaks of releasing a songbird after he's left, just here, we wonder whether this could be a metaphor for allowing him his freedom. He is her treasured songbird and she the reluctant parent who must let go of her adored son. Or perhaps it is a metaphor for the release of her own emotions which she has kept pent up inside. She alludes to these hidden emotions later in stanza three, again in the language of sewing, when she speaks here, when she speaks of how her stomach is making busy, is busy making tucks, darts, pleats, suggesting the torment of her feelings. Okay, so we've gone through and developed quite a few ideas about the poem. And what I'd like you to do now is to pause the slide, uh, to pause the video and to write down five big ideas that you think have been explored in Weir's poem. Off you go. Okay, so nearly there everyone uh finally a little task for you as you can see there are some images um on your screen now and what i'd like you to do uh you may want to draw the image uh, into your exercise book but i'd like you to find a key quote from the poem that you think links to these images i'd like you to think about whether the image and the quote link to any of the key themes that you've picked out and also to see whether you can explore the meaning of the quotation and any devices that the poet has used. Okay, so good luck with that. Um, don't be scared also to come up with some of your own interpretations. Remember, poetry can be read in lots of different ways. Every time I read a poem, there's something new that I learn or a different way that I see something. So yeah, don't be scared to, to have your own thoughts. All right. Um, all the best. Enjoy the rest of your studies.